Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Delighted, delighted to be joined today by our guest, Maud Barlow. Maud Barlow is a Canadian author and activist, who is a founding member and the former chairperson of the Council of Canadians, Canada's largest public advocacy organization. She is also the co-founder of the Blue Planet Project, which works internationally for the human right to water. Barlow is the recipient of 14 honorary doctorates, as well as many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award, which is known as the Alternative Nobel, the 2005 Lannan Foundation Cultural Freedom Fellowship Award, the Citation of Lifetime Achievement in the, at the 2008 Canadian Environment Awards, the 2009 Earth Day Canada Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award, the 2009 Planet in Focus Eco Hero Award, and the 2011 Earth Care Award, the highest international honor of the Sierra Club US. From 2008 to 2009, she served as senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the United Nations General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the UN. She chairs the board of Washington-based Food and Water Watch, is a counselor at the Hamburg-based World Future Council, and is the honorary chancellor of Brescia University. She's also served on the executive of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Barlow is also the author of 20 books, including Parcel of Rogues, How Free Trade is Failing Canada, and the Blue Trilogy on Water Protection, Rights, and Justice. Today, Maud Barlow is with Banyan Books in conversation about her new book, which is titled Still Hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of activism. In this timely book, Barlow counters the prevailing atmosphere of pessimism that surrounds us and offers lessons of hope that she has learned from a lifetime of activism. She has been a linchpin in three major movements in her life, second wave feminism, the battle against free trade and globalization, and the global fight for water justice. From each of these, she draws her lessons of hope emphasizing that effective activism is not really about the goal, rather it is about building a movement and finding like-minded people to carry the load with you. Barlow knows firsthand how hard fighting for change can be, but she also knows that change does happen and that hope is the essential ingredient. CBC says that Maud Barlow is Canada's best known voice of dissent. And CNN says, it's time we listened to the Maud Barlows of the world. Well, I have to agree with that. Banyan Books community, please join me in welcoming Maud Barlow. Maud, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Ross, for having me. And thank you to the Banyan community. I come to you from Ottawa, um, the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here with you. 
at the at the start of this wonderful, obviously very hopeful book, which is really inspiring, you you say this. My fear is that the sense of hopelessness many people now feel makes them think that the situation itself is hopeless, leading to paralysis. In writing this book, I asked myself, what is hope? Can you help us to define what hope is and how it serves us in times of challenge, Maud? Well, to me, hope is the belief, the commitment to the belief that we must protect all that is good for future generations in the planet. And that even if we don't know what the outcome is going to be, we still have to do our part. We still have to do whatever is within our power to do. We have to reach out our hand, you know, and touch the web of, of the universe where we are in the way that we can with faith uh, that it, others are doing the same. And the reason what you started off with is one of the most important themes of, of the book and the concept. I fear, and I particularly fear for young people, hearing, hey, there's only 10 years left of a healthy planet. I, I can't imagine being 16 and being told something like that. I fear that the feeling of hopelessness, as you said, might then translate into the thought that it's the situation's hopeless. And there is so much exciting work being done here in Canada and around the world on the issues, the critical issues of our time. So it's really important that we take a deep breath and step forward. And when we're overwhelmed, uh, and I quote a farmer friend of mine from Prince Edward Island who says, when you're feeling overwhelmed, just ask yourself, what's the next appropriate step to take? And you take it. Action is hope and hope is action. Wonderful, thank you. Now, you talk about uh, the opportunity for change that shows up in disaster situations and you, you refer to Rebecca Solnit's work. And um, I'm just wondering, I, first I'll read this quote, you say, when there's a disaster situation like COVID-19, for instance, the gaps in care are made evident and the chance for radical social transformation opens up. Social programs long thought impossible may come to pass. Financial desperation, homelessness and inequality can suddenly be addressed. But it is a contest, Solnit warns, as the opportunities for a more egalitarian or a more authoritarian society burst out of the gate like racehorses. Can you help us understand, like we, we're just coming out of this COVID, COVID pandemic, what are the opportunities that that presents to us in terms of driving change? Well, what Rebecca Solnit is talking about, and I think it applies here very much, is that every crisis um, disrupts, as you said, the, the old social order and gives us an opportunity to do things very differently. And there are very exciting opportunities coming out of this. One of the major lessons of COVID, of course, was that it exposed the deep inequality in our world. Not only do people in many of the global South uh, countries not have access to, to, to vaccines, they don't have access to clean water. Over half of the population of the planet doesn't have a place to wash their hands with soap and warm water, which is the first thing we were told you had to do. We're talking in, 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 in thousands and thousands of clinics in the global south where there's health clinics, where there's no running water, schools where there's no running water. So it gives us an opportunity to say, okay, it has exposed the deep inequality and we understand that that matters back here. If you don't care about them, at least care about yourself because we're not going to eradicate this until we have started to eradicate it internationally. And that means vaccines internationally, good health care internationally and, 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 uh, and water. But the other thing it exposed, and this is really, really uh, such a message that I want to say, share of hope, we saw from, I guess, about the late 70s, right through to, I'd say, well into the 2000s, this notion of economic globalization. There was, it, this was a backlash against the big social structures, the social security, of which what came out of the Second World War, the whole notion of, of human rights and so on. There was a backlash. And the backlash basically said, okay, governments have gotten too big. I quote the Trilateral Commission that says that democracy, you know, there was an excess in democracy. I love the term. Um, and that um, we should give over to the financial world um, the, all decisions around the market. 
So to big corporations that had gone transnational and uh, of the world's 100 leading economies now, 69 are corporations and only 31 are, are nation states. Just, you know, let that sink in for a minute. They have tremendous power. And economic globalization meant free trade, which meant not, you know, more goods without tariffs. It didn't mean that at all. They were mostly gone. It meant constraining what governments could do anymore in terms of protecting their people, their health care, um, labor rights, uh, and, and their resources and so on. It's basically take your hands off all of those things. All of that will be decided by the corporate world, by the world of finance. There was also privatization of social services. There was also a, a real push to uh, deregulation of environmental and health protections and, and social security protections because those all got in the way of the free market. And we were told, um, you know, this will, this will rise all boats. The big ships and the, little, and the little fishing boats will all rise. And of course, it's just nonsense. As the United Nations points out, three quarters of the world's working uh, age popul uh, population is in the precariat. They do not have permanent jobs, they don't have security, they don't have pensions, you know, they are one step away from a welfare check or no check at all. That's what we were, that's what we were promised, that was what was going to happen. Now economic globalization was exposed to be a failure by COVID, by many other things I would argue, but COVID has made it very clear. Um, one of the most obvious things, of course, is the supply chains. But when those supply chains are for vital food or vital uh, supplies for healthcare, for hospitals and so on, then it becomes, you know, it becomes really quite urgent and quite serious. And so one of the things that is just startling is when you start to look into it, how, who is saying it failed? I mean, I'd quote the International Monetary Fund that promoted uh, economic globalization with the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, like big time, right? Um, basically now saying the private sector failed us through COVID. We're going to have to go back to massive uh, government intervention. We're going to have to go back to governments taking responsibility for the health and welfare of their people and the protection of their environment. Um, you get calls from economists who touted this for decades who said oops major mistake um, and I, um, I had it I have to be honest with you Ross I had a good time quoting a lot of them <laughs> eating a little crow here <laughs> um, so we have a moment now to say okay how do we want to do it if that didn't work letting corporations make all the decisions they're gonna they're going to have their manufacturing in these countries so they can dump their toxins in the water and pay child labor, you know, and have their money hid in another place. If that isn't the way, what's the way? And I don't think anybody is talking about going back to narrow nationalism and certainly not populist nationalism, but even in terms of, of production, we have an integrated world. We want to maintain the globalization of culture and language and and literature and travel and all of that. It's, 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 it's the balance, it's finding that balance. And I think we're at a really important moment to ask those questions and to establish um, the kind of economy that we want. And that, that economy cannot be based on simply the notion of unlimited growth. And I go into in the book quite a bit about alternative economies like uh, you know, the famous uh, Raoth um, donut economy and so on, just alternative ways of looking at what we have assumed to be the only economic model. And I think we have a real opportunity here to open the door um, for something new based on what's good from the past and what we know we need to do differently in the future. Right, thank you. And this makes me think, you know, you go into the different phases of your work over the years, the women's movement with uh, international fight against economic globalization with the human right to water and sanitation. And you talk about these, these key lessons that you learned. Now, if we look to your experience, you say the first lesson you learned in, in your fight for, for women's rights uh, was that we do have to fight for our rights. I'm just gonna quote you here. You said, the first lesson I learned from these years was that governments and other major institutions were not going to give rights and power away. They remained wedded to the status quo and it was up to us to organize and fight for our rights. So in the light of what you were just talking about, how do, how do we apply that, that lesson? 
Well, we have to take the long view. And this is one of the important lessons about hope. It's not Pollyanna-ish, everything's fine or nor is it negative, uh, you know, pessimism, which is so unfine, there's nothing to be done in both cases. There's no, you know, nothing required to be done. Taking a look truly uh, at what I, I, I use the term, term from Joan Halifax, who's a spiritual leader and wonderful uh, American um, public figure. She works with men on death row, talk about hopeless situations. Um, and she talks about the need, what she calls wise hope. And wise hope is basically that you look the issue in the eye and you face it. Um, but then you take the long view and taking the long view means, that, you know, it may not be what you want in the time you want or how you want. Back to Rebecca Solnit, she says that progress isn't an army marching forward. It's a crab scuttling sideways. It's it's centuries of, of, a, of a dri water dripping on a stone, recarving it. We don't know where hope is going to come from, where change is going to come from. We only know, we can only be responsible for the peace we take. That being said, you do have to have a goal. And we were in, in the women's movement, Ross, we were, uh, uh, this was a movement whose time had come. Like when I grew up in the 50s, my mother couldn't open a bank account. She couldn't get a, a driver's license. She couldn't get a travel visa, visa without my father's signature. Um, and, you know, the, the se just several years before my mother was born, the old Empire uh, Elections Act, it wasn't the Canada Elections Act, it was just still the Empire, said no woman, idiot, lunatic, or child shall vote. I mean, it, the change in, in 100 years in the status of women, is everything fine? Of course not. But have we profoundly changed? You bet. And one of the things I tried to do in both in my life and work and in the book was, was take the lessons that I learned from building the, helping to build a women's movement and having the, that long-term commitment and then bringing that into the other areas, the environment, um, you know, um, what, what did we learn and, and what do we have to offer um, other movements on equality, on racial equality and so on um, that, we, that we took from that, those early years of fighting. But it's, you have to step back and sometimes you have to say, I need to take a break or I need to be, I talk a lot in the book about kindness because I don't think there's enough kindness in the world and I sure don't think there's enough kindness in our movement. Um, I sometimes think it's easier for people to turn on each other because they can't fight the big fight. It's just too big. So it's easier to say you're not perfect. Um, and we don't give enough credit and we're not, um, we just sometimes aren't kind enough. I don't know what else. I think in our culture, in our Western culture, it's like, get ahead, prove yourself, even in progressive movements, that's there. Um, and so it's really important to build human relationships, long-term trusting relationships that are going to get you through tough times um, and building a movement. And it's joyous work, but it's damn hard work. It reminds me of the inscription at the start of the book, what you just said, you're talking about kindness and the need to take care of ourselves and rest. It's a quote from Banksy. It says, when you are tired, learn to rest, not to quit. It's the best quote. I was going to have a whole bunch of fancy quotes at the, at the beginning and his was so perfect. I thought, nope, it's got to stand by itself. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, if you think, first of all, if you think that, something failed because of you you probably have too great a, an impression of yourself you know you're not you can't carry it all by yourself you are part of something and and I quote uh, Vandana Shiva a colleague who says that she gets deeply attached to the struggle the individual or collective struggle of the time of whatever she's working in but she is detached from the outcome now that doesn't mean you don't have an outcome in mind i mean if you are when we decided to get the united nations to recognize the human right to water and sanitation we were organized we organized an international global water justice movement and we moved but could i have said it would be this day in this way in this language it was in some ways serendipitous that it happened in the way that we wanted it to. And you have to say to yourself, and I remember standing in the, the balcony of the, of the um, United Nations General Assembly with some of my team around me and they were crying because we were pretty sure we were gonna lose. Canada was deeply opposed to the human right to water. This was under Stephen Harper. And I know it's because of the lack of water, uh, fresh water and sanitation services in First Nations communities. And he didn't want, 
the United Nations shining any kind of light on that, right? Um, and so it was embarrassing to, to be working, you know, with the UN and here's my own government uh, taking the lead. But either the US was opposed, um, Great Britain was opposed, uh, the World Bank was opposed, the big water companies were opposed. We thought we were going to lose. And when they sit in the, to vote in, in the General Assembly, they vote from their desks. And so it all comes up immediately on a, an electronic screen at the front. Boom, 141 countries voted in favor. 42 didn't vote in favor, but they didn't have the guts to vote against. They abstained, Canada included. Uh, and, and you know, you, you just, you have to say that was a picture perfect campaign in so many ways. But when we stood there, I remember saying, we're probably going to lose, but don't you be down because we'll be back here in two years or five years or 10 years. I really thought it was years and years away before we were going to be successful on this. And so it's, sometimes you'll break through and sometimes you won't. The question is, did you build on it? Did you create, do more people know about it? Did you bring young people in? Did you bring in, um, you know, different uh, communities, you know, our First Nations with you, like who's, who, who is it that you are all together? Are you sharing information? Are you building something? Are you changing the political culture? Because in the end, that's the most important thing. So, it, so it's having that long view is tremendously important. And, and this notion of, yep, uh, step back when you have to be, you know, rest, uh, don't burn yourself out and don't think you carry the whole thing on your shoulders because you don't, you carry a piece of it and you can touch the universe here where you can and you can take that piece, even if it's just bearing witness. Hope is sometimes just bearing witness, but we owe it. Hope is a moral imperative. And we who live in a country like Canada with the opportunities, and I know they're not evenly distributed, I deeply understand that, but we have, we have, an, op we have an obligation um, to bear witness to what's happening in other parts of the world where people are not free to speak out in, in the way we are. You touched on the need to build strong networks, supportive networks, and also for diversity. I want to just dive into a little bit about what you said about diversity that you learned in the women's movement. You said, as women face the future, we are stronger if we are inclusive and diverse. Movements must be constantly renewed and revitalized with new voices, new perspective, and new visions of hope. Can you speak a little bit to this need for diversity and inclusion, not just in the women's movement, but in, in all movements? Well, growing up in 1950s Ottawa is white. It was white. People on TV were white. My teachers were white. Uh, the church was white. The kids I knew were white. It was a it was a monolithic world, and it's one of the criticisms of the second wave women's movement that's legitimate. Um, and many movements start with people, you know, in the more dominant positions pushing against, uh, pushing up against for, for change. But if you don't start deeply and seriously moving towards deep and true diversity, um, you're, you're doomed. I mean, you, you, you know, on paper, the changes that we got legally, um, I mean, I had teachers when I was in, you know, in high school, I had women teachers who had a choice when the men came home from the second world war, if you get married, you have to leave your job. It was the same for government jobs. The men need the job. So these women chose not to get married, not to have kids because they didn't want to lose their jobs. We all thought that was, we all had stories about, you know, you know, he, her fiance was killed in a car accident. We're like we made all this crap up because we were silly little girls, right? <laughs> little kids. <laughs> and we didn't understand. And I understand now the choices that, that, that had to be made. So it's, 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 um, and back to your question. I got lost in a, Oh no, you were asking. Yeah. So the, the need for diversity and inclusiveness diversity. in, in, oh, in the sorry. women's movement and in, in all movements. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got, I got remembering these, these. Yeah, no, it's a nice digression. I mean, my the, generation, we hear about the, the spinsters. Was, I've heard my mom and grandmother it, it, talk about that, but terrible. it was terrible. But so, yes, what I was going to say is when we did get legal changes, changes for women like that, so that women could legally work, um, changes so that women could open a bank account, so that they could have a higher education and so on. Technically, on paper, it looked fine, right? Um, that men and women, and we talked about pay equity, but it's one thing if you're a woman 
in a law firm competing for a job or a pay equity with a male colleague, and maybe you don't make as much, but you're making pretty damn good money, right? Compared to a, a person who's newly arrived in Canada, who's working as a, a part-time cook in a long-term care facility, who are you comparing yourself to then? So it became very clear as we began to really understand the dimensions of what we were dealing with and what we call intersectionality, as you know, which is looking at, at race and class and income and background and, and gender and all of those things together. We began to really understand that what might look equal on paper was not going to serve everyone. And it was that notion of, of really deeply understanding that, that um, transform the women's movement. And I think we're still dealing with those, I know we're still dealing with those issues um, today. And I, I think it's very important for us, to, a couple of things on this issue. And one is that you can't ask the equality seeking uh, groups, identity groups to say, well, I'm gonna put that on hold and we'll work on the bigger, you know, for Pharmacare or whatever, we're going, we're, no, we'll join you on the bigger campaign. But nor, because you can't ask that, it's not right. But nor can we stop the working on the things that pull us together. And, and the question then becomes, how do you do that? How do you continue to move together in the, on the big picture that does impact us all in a way that's deeply respectful of the need for that, um, that introspection on, on how we do deep diversity? Uh, and I also think we have to realize we're not gonna get it perfect. You know, to think, okay, well, it should be fixed by now. It's not going to be fixed by now. This is very deep. These roots of, of racism um, are very deep in our society and uh, in our culture, and they're not going to be overnight uh, finished. But I, I did, I do write about one important po poll that was done. Um, uh, Michael Adams, who, who, who. Um, uh, looked at the whole concept of inclusion and refugees and migrants and where Canadians are because we've all seen the rise of uh, violent incidents, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, um, anti-Asian violence, uh, the people who connect in their minds, COVID or whatever. So we, we know this is, we know anti-Black uh, violence and, and, and racism. We know this exists. And it is more obvious now, and I live in Ottawa Centre, which is the area uh, where the convoy was for three weeks. And let me tell you, there was a lot of white supremacism. There a lot of really ugly stuff happened. I looked this way because that's where it was, right down, right down in my street. Um, but this pollster found, and he said in four, four decades of, of doing polling, he has never seen Canadians as open, as wanting to um, uh, recognize and welcome refugees, migrants, to recognize that we have racism, systemic racism in our society, in our past. Um, I quote other polls that show Canadians have never been more, uh, non-Indigenous Canadians have never been more uh, welcoming, wanting uh, of reconciliation than, than we are now. That, that so that so if people think that their overt acts of violence and, and discrimination and racism are impacting the society, it's the opposite. They're driving people away from that. And that the majority, the vast majority of settlers of non-indigenous uh, uh, people uh, are, are just, are, are wanting to move ahead. And I just, these are the areas of hope that I think we need to, to don't, it's not to deny the, the crises or the individual uh, acts, but to say, is that where we're going as a society? And I, I found it so gratifying to, to find that I don't think that's where we are as a majority, which doesn't mean we don't have lots of pockets of it to deal with. I think a lot of people know, at least on the surface, that water, things like water justice, land justice, climate change are intricately tied with justice and rights for Indigenous peoples. Can you help us understand more deeply what the connection is there? Well, we have made war on nature, have we not? Here, particularly in the Western world, we, uh, you know, the Bible tells us we're dominant, we're on top of the, you know, we're on top of the pyramid, and we have domination and dominion over others, and the Indigenous world says that's nonsense. We are uh, of the species. We are our nature, if you heard you hurt nature, you're hurting us. If we heal nature, we're healing ourselves. And um, we have seen water, just as an example, but nature truly as a resource for our uh, convenience and profit 
Um, and so we take water from where nature put it and or the creator put it and we move it to where we want it. We pollute whatever toxics we want into it because particularly in this country, we have what I call the myth of abundance. There's so much water, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, you know, we dam our rivers to death. Most of the major rivers in the world don't reach the ocean anymore. Um, we dump our, our nutrient overload from factory farms uh, and industrial farms into lakes like Lake Winnipeg, which is, you know, very ill many summers with blue green algae and so on. We just think it exists to serve us and our notion of unlimited growth and industrial growth. And we have come up against it. I mean, we are a planet in trouble. I know I've got a book on hope out, but I'm not going to stop talking about the troubles that we have, not just the climate crisis as we understand it, but the water crisis. I mean, we have a situation, a, a, a planet where the demand for water is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. I mean, it really is a very serious crisis. We have a crisis in our oceans. We are have a crisis with plastics, like we know this. Um, and so it's really important that we come together um, to deal with this and, and, and look at it straight in the face um, and say, you know, we, we have to come together somehow to, to deal with these issues um, as a community together. And the, the Indigenous teachings tell us how to do this. And one of the good things that I've talked about in the book is that uh, there's what I call a tsunami of understanding about uh, the need for biological and biodiversity um, protection and uh, restoration. That yes, while we are working to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate, the climate crisis, we cannot ignore the need to, to protect and restore watersheds, uh, um, uh, uh, wetlands, soil and forests. And uh, there's a lot of now understanding of this. And I think a lot of it comes from indigenous teachings. Uh, you know, you watch COP26 in Glasgow and you heard people who were leaders standing up at the top of the mic, you know, the stages and the, from the top and from the microphones using the same language as the protesters and the grassroots youth and indigenous people in the streets. Did they mean it? I'm not sure, but the language is there. There has been an understanding um, that we need to move to what I call the age of nature which is that unless we make peace with nature, unless we learn the indigenous teachings, um, we are on a collision course with survival. And uh, that's, those deep teachings are, are there. And I, I deeply feel, Ross, that Canadians are getting ready for that, for that lesson, for that next step. When I first discovered water as an issue, I wasn't because of the environment. I took water for granted like everybody I knew. It was from reading the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement back in 1985 and looking at the annex at the back that talked about what, uh, what was a tradable good, things like running shoes and cars. And there was water in all its forms, including ice and snow. And I can remember thinking, what? How can water be a tradable good I don't understand. And that sent, set me off on a journey to ask the question, well, who owns water? Who is making decisions about water? And I very soon found out that we're a planet running out of accessible clean water because of the abuse that we have uh, heaped on the Earth's uh, water heritage and that it is deeply unevenly and unjustly shared, right? This became very, very clear. So yeah, it's... It, 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 so you come back, you, you must come back um, to a reverence for water. So what started for me was just startling reality or, or recognition that somebody was going to get some American politicians and, and corporate leaders are going to get a hold of Canada's water for commercial purposes really leads back to um, the notion that water is sacred and, and led me to a, a whole journey to understand um, the, the sacred and, and profound nature of, of water. Thank God that you started that journey for all of us. Um, you know, I just want to remind our, our live audience, we're going to um, take some of your questions from Maud Barlow in the next uh, 10 minutes here. So please go ahead and type in on the, on the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. There are a lot of hopeful stories in your book. Um, one of the things that you, you just briefly touched on it, 
is the the issue of ecosystem restoration. Uh, I found this really exciting. Um, and you said that in an October 2020 edition of Nature, uh, that this is what it said. The scientists found that restoring natural landscapes damaged by human exploitation can be one of the most effective and inexpensive ways to combat the climate crisis while also boosting dwindling wildlife populations. Can you tell us, you know, just more about this? What, what are some of the exciting things that you're seeing in terms of ecosystem restoration? Well, we're understanding now that we have destroyed so much of the world's forests and so much of the world's, so many of the world's wetlands. And these are the protective uh, buffers for water. You can't protect water if you're not, if you're taking down all the trees. And, and um, so it's absolutely essential that we get back to um, uh, protecting and, uh, and restoring. It's not just protecting, but restoring um, watersheds and forests. It's really important when we do that, that we're not talking about planting, you know, eucalyptus forests somewhere else as a, as a carbon offset. I'm not at all talking about that. And I found, just read the other day about a very exciting project in Great Britain where they're using the seeds and acorns and, and seedlings of hundreds, hundreds, some of them thousand year old trees to create new healthy forests that are not those, you know, um, industrial uh, type forests. Um, but we need to plant trees, we need to stop cutting down, our, our destroying our wetlands. And what we've learned about water, and this is very important, we think about the hydrologic cycle, and we all learned this back in school, that there's this kind of, we see it as the hydrologic cycle around the planet, right? And what we don't understand is that the hydrologic cycles are local. And if you, and they all need vegetation, they need water and they need sunlight. And if you remove either the vegetation or the water from that biosphere, that biosystem, you are going to negatively impact the, that local um, uh, watershed, that local cycle, water cycle. And what we know is that that's one of the reasons that um, we're seeing increased desertification all over the world is that we are removing water or we're removing dead vegetation. In the 1930s in the Dust Bowl, they took so much prairie grass down so fast so that they could uh, create farming that they know and they knew then and we know now that it dried up the topsoil and the topsoil blew away, that, hence the Dust Bowl. And what was very common understanding until only about 10 years ago was that it, at, coincidentally, there was a terrible drought. Well, it's no coincidence at all. Studies now show very clearly that the cutting down of the grass impacted the local hydrologic cycles. The rain won't come back if there isn't vegeta ve vegetation. So the act of cutting down that, that taking, removing that vegetation actually created um, drought. And so we're beginning to understand in a different way the impact of removing forests, removing vegetation, changing watersheds, moving water out of the watershed, and, and the impact that that's having on climate crisis. We know that the climate, the, that climate change impacts water, but we haven't, I don't think, and I, I say this in a, you know, as a, not a criticism, but just a fact that in many, many uh, instances, um, uh, people talking about climate, the climate crisis, whether they're scientists or activists or whatever, teachers, whatever, talk about it as one package. And so drought has to be linked to climate change. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe that drought is because they um, were dump pumping that water far faster than nature could replenish it. And then when that happens, then we are creating new zones of heat and new zones of desert. And that becomes part of the cause of the climate crisis. So this understanding that restoring nature, restoring nature's um, um, ability to come back, or as David Suzuki says, I love it, he says, if we stop um, destroying nature, it will, be, it will be kinder to us than we deserve, which I think is quite wonderful. <laughs> um, so it, it's this notion that while we are moving to, um, you know, deal with the, the, the climate crisis from the reduce, from energy transition, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and so on, I'm not for a minute saying that's not important, we can't ignore the need for this uh, biodiversity re restoration. And Canada has made promises, 2 billion trees to be um, planted, which has already been started. 
30% um, of our land and 30% of our waters off the coast um, have to be preserved um, so that they're biologically whole, which doesn't mean people don't live there, but that we are uh, going to protect them. Um, uh, we've taken uh, agreements on methane. We've taken agreements, we're beginning agreements in international agreement on plastics in the ocean. There is actually a lot of work being done in some very important ways at some very important levels. One of the things that is most troubling about this awful war in um, Ukraine is not only in and of itself how horrific it is and how it's changing the geopolitical reality of the world, but it's also putting all of these issues a bit on the back burner. And that is something I caution us about when we're talking about um, finding ways to, to deal with that horrific uh, reality is not giving up on, on, on what we have to do around the climate and what we have to do for the environment because we don't have time really to stop and, and um, stop doing the work that we've been doing. Um, but there's lots being done and that's part of the message of the book. It's so funny because when I was, well, when I would start to write, because I've written lots of books about bad things, there's this, these stats and these stories and pummeling people with the stats, particularly on water. And I would stop myself. I'd say, no, I'm writing a book on hope. So I go, okay, I'm going to get in two paragraphs. I get to tell the whole bad story here and the rest of it's got to be good. And I made myself look at the good stuff because there is work being done. And it's important that people say, okay, what is that? What part can I do? What, where, how can I, how can I enter into that piece of it? What can I do? Um, and that working to a solution, taking a deep breath and saying, okay, I may grieve, but I'm not going to despair. I'm going to take action. It's extraordinarily uh, important. And the Indigenous teachings are, are, are central um, to that understanding. One of the things I love is, is this, this message of uh, one of the sections early on in the book is titled, Take Hope from the Goodness of Others. And you emphasize that there's so much hope in, in, in the relationships and, and people, the kindness of strangers. And you tell a lot of stories from your travels. One of the stories about a relationship, and there's a quote, you talk about your relationship with the great Canadian author, Margaret Lawrence. And the, the quote that you share from her speech called My Final Hour is so beautiful. I, I wonder, do you have it there to share? I have it here if it's, if you don't have it handy. I, I, I have it, but I wouldn't be able to put my hand on it as quickly. Okay, so I'll share it and I'd love to hear your comments on, on her and this. She, she said in this speech to Trent University in 1983, try to feel in your heart's core the reality of others. This is the most painful thing in the world, probably, and the most necessary. In times of personal adversity, know that you are not alone. Know that although in the eternal scheme of things you are small, you are also unique and irreplaceable, as are all of your fellow humans everywhere in the world. Know that your commitment is above all to life itself. Well, she was a great honor to get to be, to know and to be friends with Margaret Lawrence. First of all, I think she's one of the greatest Canadian authors ever. And so just to get to know that mind and to sit quietly over a cup of tea and, and hear her speak about this. And she would wear, oh, you know, an old skirt and an old shirt. And she, you know, she like, it wasn't about her putting something to the world. It was about her, her deep spiritual uh, ability to care. Um, and that quote is just pure Margaret Lawrence. She was talking more there about potential of, of, of nuclear war or war of any kind. But at that time, that was uh, on her mind. But you could easily say that for the climate crisis. You could easily say that for the, the, the geopolitical crisis that we're in right now with, uh, with Russia and Ukraine and everything else. You could say that partly around the pandemic, that we're in a, uh, an existential crisis. Uh, and it is, th that's the act of kindness, is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to understand where they're coming from. Now, I'm not talking about trying to understand a bigot or someone who's violent. Uh, I'm not talking about that, but really trying to, to hear a different perspective. Um, and 
when she talks about that, she's, she really came out of herself. She was deeply, deeply involved in the peace movement, which is how I got to know her. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a, an honor to have had her in my life. Just, these are these ships passing in the night. And when she was gone, it was just a little hole that got left in my heart. We've got some uh, nice looking questions coming in from our audience here, if you're open to um, Absolutely. attending to some of those. Okay. The first one is from Anne. Anne says, for folks who are just waking up to the urgent need for action, what suggestions do you have for entry points to participation in movements that will support restoration and progress? Well, thank you, Anne, for that. You know, when Greta Thunberg was 11 years old, she learned about the climate crisis and it upset her so badly that she went into a deep depression um, for two years. She lost 20 pounds on that little frame. And then one day she got up and she walked out of her house and she went down and sat in front of the parliament buildings in Stockholm, Sweden, her country. And she sat there every day for two years. Um, and she started, as you know, a youth movement. And what was really important for her, and she says this every time she's asked, it was that when she went, what took her out of despair was action. She took action. She wasn't sure where it was going to lead. She could not have imagined it would have led to the position that she's in now. But she did know that if she didn't take action, she wasn't going to make it physically. She was like making herself ill. And that's the difference between grief and despair that I go into in the book quite a bit, because I think it's important to make that distinction. You, we should grieve. We should be grieving for the planet. We should be grieving for what's happening in, in Ukraine. We should be grieving, but not despair, because despair leads to, a, you know, there's a door you can't find because, you, because of the despair. Um, it's so, so Anne, I don't know how active you are, who you are, but it, it, the, asking that question is the very first step. You've already taken a step by asking that. And then it's to ask yourself what issues matter to you, finding organizations and other people who feel the same way you do. It could be a municipal, progressive municipal um, issues group. It could be something to do with, um, you know, I don't know, fighting a quarry or fighting some toxic dumping or what it could be something quite specific. <clears throat> it can be finding one of the larger groups and joining and becoming part of something larger than yourself. Learning, be on a lifelong learning curve as much as you can. You need to continue, we all need to continue to learn. Um, I, I sat down the other day and I thought, I've got to go back and do a crash course in the Ukraine. I got to, re I got to remind myself of the Orange Revolution and you know, I, I remember it really clearly, and then I forgot about it. And now we just have to continue on this lifelong journey of, of learning. Um, and don't get discouraged. Get, get worried. Um, and, you know, it, of course, uh, as I say, grief, uh, grieving is, is part of reality. But uh, please, please uh, find people who feel like you do um, and, uh, and get involved. Take a step. Thank you, Maude, and thanks for your question, Anne. There's, there's another question here from Warren. It's a bit of a longer question, but a good one. Warren says, from your experience being in communication with politicians over the years, what is your sense about what motivates politicians as individuals and collectively? Is it a quagmire of personal devious ambition? Is it admirable heroism? Is it primarily well-intentioned yet compromised individuals bogged down by the limitations of a broken system? I'm sure there are a wide range of motivations, but as someone who has never been close to the arena of politics, I've wondered how much some of these public perceptions reflect reality or not. My goodness, Warren, you should be a writer. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Um, all of those things apply to some members of parliament, some members of your provincial legislature and your city councillors. You get people who are in there for, for power. You get people who are in there um, uh, for ideological reasons. Uh, you know, we've been pretty upset here in Ottawa that a number of conservative MPs came down and joined the convoy, even though there were confederate flags and nazi symbols and, and stuff so uh you know we can pretty um 
uh, pretty uh, uh, angry about that and certainly can, can be critical of that. But there are many fine people in politics for the right reasons, who really deeply care, who want to make a difference, who get in there and realize it's not as easy as it looked from the outside and that you have to, as my Irish aunt would say, put a skin on it. You know, yeah, you can't get everything you want uh, as you want it, when you want it. But I think, um, I know I know so many good politicians from from different political parties. Uh, and I think we need to be very careful not to assume that all politicians are, are in it for the wrong reason. Now, I learned early on that rather than me and a group of people like me, who kind of maybe were kind of out front, uh, we push politicians ourselves. It's much, much, much better to have a highly educated population that's, that ordinary people care about these issues and they're going to get to their members of parliament or they're going to get to their MLAs or their MPPs. It's, they don't, this politician doesn't care what Maude Barlow thinks. This politician cares what the voters in his or her riding think. That's what they think. And that's why movement building is so important. And we learned years ago that you will have to have a range of information out there. Like I write books and, but sometimes we take a tr complicated trade agreement or a tr complicated, um, uh, uh, a scientific study and we get somebody to kind of translate it into really easy to access language. Sometimes it'll be a fact sheet. Sometimes it's a comic book. You want to have a variety of ways of getting basic information out to as many people as possible. We need better education on these issues so that people don't fall down these rabbit holes and start believing things that are just, you know, insane uh, around vaccines or around uh, you know, the, the, well, again, the, the, the purpose of politics, you just, it, we really need, um, we really need to speak to each other in a very careful way. And we need, and that's why organize, or organizing matters. And that's why that links you, Warren, to Anne's question about um, that kind of activity. So yes, we have good politicians and we have good people who go into politics and we need good people in politics. But we also need good people who are out there pushing the good people in politics, exposing the bad people in politics and pushing the good people because it's darn hard to push something up there if you're sitting in a cabinet meeting or whatever and there's nobody behind you saying that they care about that issue. If you can say my constituents and everybody else says, yeah, my constituents too, we've been getting a lot of noise about that. That really matters. And that's the sign of a, of a healthy uh, democracy. I think there's a there's a question here from Liz Marshall, and it ties into mm -hmm. something you just said about young getting young people involved. She says, "Hi, Maud. It's your friend and comrade, Liz Marshall. Thank you for this timely new book. Is there a plan for this book to get into the hands of young people?" Well, Liz, hello, sweetheart. How are you? Liz is a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker. She did a, directed a film on my work and she's, her latest is called Meet the Future. Um, and I just lead you, I direct you, I encourage you to go to Liz Marshall's uh, website and learn about um, the wonderful work that she does. Um, and Liz and I have talked a lot about reaching young people. And while this book, Liz, wasn't written specifically for young people, I had young people in mind from day one. I have four teenage grandkids and I watched them watching the world and hearing, you know, the planet's got 10 good years and the sixth great extinction is upon us and the birds and the insects are all going. And, and I see the anxiety. I do a lot of work with young people. I see the anxiety and I see how if I speak about hope and I tell them about good things that we're doing, they blossom. When I say you can do something, we created this problem that we have or these problems that we have together and we can, we can tackle them together. Young people are just rise to that occasion. So yes, I would love to have lots of young people um, read this book. Um, Liz would know that we had a project called Blue Communities where um, a municipality would pledge to protect water as a human right, a public trust, so no privatization and to, to phase out bottled water on municipal premises and events. We're now wanting to launch a Blue Schools project um, where we will have uh, schools become a Blue School by pledging uh, same kind of thing to teach their young people and their students uh, about the human right to water, about the need to protect water and to 
um, um, phase out the sale of, of plastic bottled water uh, on school premises, because I really think we need to get to that um, generation. So yes, Liz, it wasn't written only for young people. It was written for, well, older activists who might be burned out to anybody. Um, but I did have young people. I did have my grandkids in mind. In fact, it's the dedicated to my grandkids and all the grandkids of the world. They used to talk tonight to hear from me, Liz. And um, our awesome podcast producer and events curator, Jacob Steele, just posted Liz's website. It's Liz Mars, L-I-Z-M-A-R-S dot com for anybody who wants to check it out. I think we have time for one more question here. This one is from Diana, who says, Maud, it's been almost two decades since I was a youth activist on a train with you and Tony between the World People's Economic Forum in New Delhi and the World Social Forum in Mumbai. Yeah. During COVID, I focused on developing and delivering safe access to water and washroom programs for people at high risk of overdose death and gendered violence as businesses shut down. In urban contexts, what role do you think municipalities have to promote and act on water and sanitation as a human right. Wow, Diana, thank you so much for that. And yes, that was an incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful trip. Um, th that was the uh, uh, World Social Forum in, uh, in Delhi. And uh, yeah, it was just amazing. I sat outside, went to Plachamata where there was a Coca-Cola plant and the local women in the village had been sitting for three years, every single day from dawn to dusk with their, the grandmothers, the mothers, the, the, the little kids um, in opposition because the, the Coca-Cola was destroying the, the water table in, in that area. Um, and we, you know, they were, I mean, I was just there to be supportive. They were successful in getting the courts to close down uh, that Coca-Cola plant. Municipalities play a huge role. We in Canada are still lucky and fortunate enough, although I don't take it for granted, that we have, by and large, have clean, safe tap water coming out of our municipal systems um, and reasonably priced. It's not the way it is in the U.S. Uh, approximately 15 million people have their water shut off every year in the U.S. because they can't afford um, to pay the water rates. And very similarly, in some countries in Europe, water is just shut off when people can't pay. So this notion that this is all far away and uh, poorer countries of the global south, that's to be taken out of our minds, you know, as the price of water goes up, as water is privatized, as water is more destroyed, we're going to have more of a, a tussle, more of a contest around water and whether it's a commodity to be put on the open market like oil and gas, or of course, the way I don't agree with that, the way I see it is that it's a human right, a public trust and a public service. So municipalities have a huge role to play in maintaining uh, a public, public control over water. Yes, you have a water service charge, but it's for the service, not for the water. It's very important that we understand we don't own water. It belongs to the earth and all, all beings and all future generations. And again, that's back to the um, indigenous teachings. Thank you. Thanks. And her name, uh, uh, her last name is Herford. It's Diana Herford. Yes. Hi, Diana. Um, before we close, I, I have one more closing question for you. I just want to take a moment to thank our audience for, for being so amazing and for all of your wonderful questions, Banyan. We've got such a great community. So thanks to you all. Big thanks to Jacob Steele, our podcast producer and events curator. And everybody at Banyan Books, from ownership all the way to the front of house staff at Banyan, who all do such an amazing job. We've been speaking with Maud Barlow about her new book, Still Hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism. And of course, you can get that at Banyan Books, banyan.com, or visit us in person. Maud, at the start of the book, you share a beautiful passage from the Talmud that is very hopeful. And I'm wondering if you'd share that with us now and leave us with some final thoughts on hope going forward. I will do that. And I will leave you with two thoughts, if I could. Um, the Talmud, I find this quote very, very timely in terms of the, the horror that we're watching in Ukraine and the feeling of 
again, hopelessness, which we must not allow to make us think that the situation is hopeless. But the Talmud says this, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but nor are you free to abandon it. And that's the notion of hope and looking to the long term. The other quote that I would leave you with is the lovely words of the poet laureate of Washington, D.C., who's also the chair of the board of um, the Institute for Policy Studies. His name is E. Ethelbert Miller. He's a much loved African-American poet. Um, and he says this, and I want to leave, leave you and thank you, Ross for, and Jacob and everyone for this lovely um, hour. He says, place your heart in your hands and blow gently, spread love like seed. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>